Okay. Um, so this is a, a little bit where we're at, but um, I need to take you a little bit further so that um, we can address some key issues. You want to change that then, Apti? Okay. We need to take the next step, yeah? And this is what we're basically here for. In order for Australia to decolonise in a non-violent way, our nations need to rebuild and recover from an ongoing genocide and impose assimilation. Now, in that discussion, when Gary and I keep talking about this, and he's, he's, actually, he's actually convinced me of something, and I think we need to make, make this known to all our people. Whether we like to believe it or not, and whether we like to admit it, we are at war. Yeah? We are at war. And um, so if you run around with people like me, you'll understand it a lot more about how we're under war. Yeah? Uh, but I dare say that you don't have to run around with me because you can talk, when, I, when we talk about this now, um, you will see it for yourself because you'll recognise it in your own community. You'll recognise it where you come from. Um, so if we, the, just to start off on that war, and we won't go too far into it, but I can tell you this, one of the instructions um, that was given to Philip when he arrived here to set up the colony of New South Wales in 1788, on the 26th of January, he did not declare um, the ownership of this country in the name of the, of the King of England at the time, on 26th of January, 1788. The proclamation was actually made on the 14th, I think it's the 14th of February, 1988, at Sydney Cove. 1788, 1788, at Sydney Cove. So the proclamation came on the 14th of January, um, 1788. February, or February? February. 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 So the 26th of January is a bit of a misnomer. That's why they changed the currency on the 14th of February. It's a key date for that. That's the date they, that's the date they actually claimed ownership of this country formally by a letters patent issued from the King of England. And he read that proclamation at Sydney Cove, 14th of February, 1788. Um, so the, the date was of uh, 26th of January was only the date he arrived. And one thing that um, um, Ellie found out with her research is that um, they had those six ships, but what they don't tell anyone is that there were a number of uh, um, man of war ships from England that came with Governor Philip. So if there was any resistance, they had those man of war ships that they could bring into the harbour and just let off those cannons and blast the blackfellas to pieces, um, as they did in Nigeria taken them up the rivers in Nigeria uh, before getting here uh, at the end before to enforce the treaty that they had signed in terms of natural resources from uh, with the Nigerian uh, tribes. And, and so when, the, when they decided they didn't want to deal with the British anymore, the British said, because they had that treaty with them, the British felt that they had, they, they had all legal authority to enforce the treaty. And so they sent in the man of war ships up the rivers in Nigeria and just blasted the hell out of all of the, um, all of the villages and just killed them off, hundreds. Okay, next one. Oh, by the way, just on that, the one thing that... In, in the instructions to Governor Philip, there is a clause in there which said you are to apply the rules and disciplines of war. So any resistance that he met from Aboriginal people they had to resist, they had to force their way in using uh, war tactics. So it came from the War Office. And so Australia was settled under the rules and disciplines of war. So it was a proper invasion, that's what it was. And they've never taken that away, that, that order in council. That, that order in council has never been superseded by another order in council taken away the use of war tactics against Aboriginal people from that date to this. It's never been taken away. Okay, so in 1941, um, this fellow, Roosevelt, uh, made a, said to this fellow, Churchill, we're not coming into the war unless you sign an agreement with us. 
and the Americans didn't want England to have all the power they had around the world, and so they asked him, he said to Roosevelt, we want you to break up the, uh, the British Empire and give back to the people who you've colonised, give back to those states uh, the right of being self-determining. And so they set up all these uh, independent uh, territories and they say a third, uh, this is the third article of this, of the Atlantic Charter, they respect the right of people to choose the form of government under which they will live and they wish to see sovereign rights and self-governing restored to the people, to those who have been forcibly deprived of them. That is a legal document signed between President Roosevelt and Churchill in 1941 under the Atlantic Charter. Okay, so the right of self-determination is right there under our noses and the legal frameworks are already established. I just got a question, like, um, somebody said to me before, I can't remember you, but they said that since the end of World War II, we're actually under martial law. So if we're under martial law, hmm. what does that mean? No, it's not martial, it's not martial law, it's, it's actually, um, we're under, we're, we, we, it's defined as war. We are under the, we are under, under war, we're at, uh, we're at war, they're at war with us. And they apply that. Now, the, um, the, the Northern Territory intervention um, can be classified as a martial law. They've imposed martial law on the Northern Territory, right? And they use the war power to do that. And uh, that's where that... They removed the racial discrimination. Yes, they exempted themselves from the Racial Discrimination Act. They didn't have to take it to the Parliament to get the parliamentary approval because they had the power to get the Governor to sign off on it and the Governor signed off on it using his prerogative powers granted to him by the Queen of England, who has sovereignty over Australia. That's how they got the Northern Territory intervention into place. Otherwise, it wouldn't, if it had gone through Parliament, it, it would, never have, would never have happened. So they used the war power to put the Northern Territory... And was Territory that the NT government? No, the Commonwealth government. The Commonwealth government, yeah. And the Commonwealth government still has powers over the Northern Territory. Yeah, because we're in the Territory. Yeah. So that's our, So this is how they use these powers to supersede the powers of the state. They use the military power um, and they get the governor to sign off on it. Next one. Decolonisation, the Blue Water Principle, excluded Australia. So that 1941 there, they were saying that they had, there was a process where the League of Nations at that time were saying that we need to um, decolonise and give self-determination to all these dependent nations or colonies around the world. And so the decolonisation, they listed a whole number of places in the, in the League of Nations that had to be decolonised. And if you look at that, they excluded Australia from, the, from that list. Okay. And by the way, um, this is the, the real national anthem of Australia. That, you see that song they sing? Yeah, um, what do you call it? Advanced Australia Fair? It says, Australia, uh, White Australia March, um, composed the national song play. White Australia, this march introduces a grand chorus. White Australia March, Australia, the white man's land. Defended by the white man's guns, Australia, Australia. For Anglo-Saxon race and Southern, Southern Cross. God bless and help us to protect our glorious land, Australia. Of the, national uh, of the national policy song, and this is intended to characterize character uh, to character the uh, aspirations of the Australian born, depicting in musical form the patriotic spirit of the race, together with the proud determination to take a foremost place amongst the leading nations in the world. So that's the chorus there. There, um, Australia, the white man's land. Was so that the first national yeah, anthem? That was the national anthem. How dare I use God to ask for the blessing on my yeah, ancestors? Yeah. And so the, the, this, is, this is all the stuff that went out, and they marched, and this is one of the um, things when they marched on the 26th of January. This is the banner they marched mm -hmm. under when they first started marching in Melbourne on Australia Day. <coughs> As you can see, Australia, the white man's land. Yeah. 
And so, yeah, advanced um, and composed, and that's one of the courses that they left out of Advanced Australia Fair. And it was Advanced Australia White, and they changed it to Australia Fair. When so did fair. they leave that uh, part out, Michael? Hmm? When did they take out that part that you were... When they, when they decided to create um, Advanced Australia as the national anthem. And so they had to take the, the word white out and put fair in there. Advanced Australia fair means Advanced Australia white. Yeah, that's how they changed it. Next one. So your argument is that they didn't take it out, they actually just hid it. They just hid it. Just hid it. Yeah, that's right. And so our position now is we, in order for us to really fight proper way, we need to know what our rights are. If you don't know what your rights are, you've got no hope of ever trying to start some type of resistance. Yeah? And that's why those little books are on your table. Take them, read them to your people, give it to them, so that they can see what their rights are. And they're all international uh, legal norms. Okay, next one. Uh, the right to self-determination, a way to world peace. <coughs> Article 1, the ICCPR, the International Covenant, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and Article 1 on the International Covenant on, uh, what is it, Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. All people have the right to self-determination by virtue of that right. They freely determine their political status and freely pursue their eco economic, social and cultural development. Okay, so this is the thing here. This is a standard right now recognised throughout the world as an international legal right. And so when people stand in our way, we throw this at them. Now, in the courts in Australia, people say, well, how can we make them take notice of that? It's easy because all this year, ICCPR, ICESCA, and I, um, a couple of others, when you go back through the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Act that I showed you yesterday, um, this one here, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Act 1995 Commonwealth, when you get down with the ILC here, and they start talking in the section in that act, that talks about the ILC, this is where they imported all these laws into Australian common law, international law, and they brought them in through that act. And so these here and this is now a legal right within Australia. And, we, and if they try and interfere with us, we can take them to court over their interference in us asserting those rights. Okay. Um, the basis of independence is that A, you must have a land base, you must have a population, you must have the ability to develop an economic that is sustainable. You also must have the ability to govern. You must also have the ability to trade, treaty, and enter into other international relations. These are the, the um, five principles that will give you the right um, to become an independent nation state. Okay. Uh, the Maori Treaty, there are two versions of the Maori Treaty. Um, in the Maori, uh, there's a, one written in the Maori language. And by the way, um, the Watangi is a particular area in New Zealand. Um, um, the, there's a lot of people in the south, the Maori's in the south, Wellington, up north of um, Auckland, and those places. They were never party of this treaty. They were never a party to the treaty at all. And they resist the Treaty of Watangi to this day because it takes away their sovereignty. But nonetheless, it's recognised now in international law, it's recognised by the British, recognised by Australia, and it's also in New Zealand. And um, the New Zealand government um, have done all sorts of things to try and satisfy the treaty uh, requirements. Um, and what they've done is that they've applied all those laws that give rights to treat to the Maori people, and they spread that nationwide, even though it's only relating to an area where the, where the Treaty of Waitangi took place. But all those things in that treaty now apply to all the people in New Zealand. And this is the problem we have here. If we develop a, a treaty in this country and it comes out at the, at the Commonwealth level, well then all those nations who don't want to be part of that will be impacted by it because they will say these are the rights that we're not going to do any more for you people other than what we've written in this treaty with this mob. And that's why it's dangerous for our mob, one nation, to enter into a treaty with the Commonwealth Government because then it'll be applicable right across the board to everybody. They're not going to give it give us any more than what those people agree to. That's why we've got to hammer those nations and we've got to go to them and say, you've got an impact on us. They'll argue, no, we won't do that, we won't do that. But we know from experience 
and history, it will impact on all of us, even if we say we don't want to do it. Right. US and Canadian treaties. Um, these treaties between the First Nations peoples are generally, generally um, um, controlled by these general domestic treaties. And when we talk about these domestic treaties, this is important. Because you see, when we're starting, when we start getting down the road of talking about treaty, the first thing we've got to think about is are we, do we want to be recognised as an international group of people and have international law applied to our treaties? Or do we want to let the government, and we recognise and we cede all our powers to the Australian government, the territory governments and the state governments, and so we come under their laws? This is what we have to work out. We've never had the opportunity to talk about this yet. At, we, we did investigate this at, uh, with the NAC, and I'll show you some things what the government did in terms of expressing some serious concerns about what we were doing there when I was heading the treaty uh, negotiation. Laws of dreaming. Well, we heard yesterday, you know, um, uh, we're not in dream time. You know, we, we real. Um, but this is something that everybody in this country sort of goes to, like we call Chupapa, Gomorrah, and there's other, other names for, uh, for our law. But the law of the dreaming, the Gomorrah and Malek, is our ancient law that underpins the unity between our nations and peoples in Australia. And that's what I talked about earlier this morning, about that common law with the song lines, where we connect all them stories through ceremony, etc., and songs. The law of dreaming is of this land. So that's the international continental common law. That's the continental common law of this land. That's what I'm talking about. Our people connection to all things natural are regulated by our laws. Yeah? So we are governed by these laws of the creation. Aboriginal engagement and association of the natural world are all in.